So hello, uh, my name is Sam Proctor, uh, along with uh, Dr. Ipek Askaya, I'm going to be talking about modern uh, software lifecycle practices. So these are practices that you can use as you uh, create software, as you maintain it, uh, sort of throughout the, uh, the software lifecycle. So uh, like I said, my name is Sam Proctor, I'm a researcher here uh, at the SEI. I'm co-PI on a project that I'm going to be talking uh, a lot about today um, called Integrated Safety and Security Engineering. Um, last year, if you were here, you may have heard me talk about a different project, uh, Guided Architecture Trade Space Evaluation, that uh, we thought was really cool. Uh, my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Askaya. She's a co-PI on tech data analysis through software analytics, and actually a deputy of the Software Architecture Practices Initiative. And it doesn't say it up here, uh, but I want to mention also that EPEC is now the editor-in-chief of uh, IEEE Software, so uh, that's, that's really exciting. So there are a couple of the DOD's priorities that this work really focuses on, um, but mainly what we're interested in and what you're going to hear about sort of all of this feeding into is preserving and advancing the DOD's competitive, competitive advantage. And we do that in a couple of ways. So as you build these systems, uh, you are no doubt aware that uh, modern systems are getting harder to build on cost and on schedule. A large part of that is uh, the increased technological demands. Uh, that these systems are making of, of new technology and, and new ways of doing things. But of course, that's even harder when you're evolving existing systems to exploit these technologies. Uh, and if you can do that, then those systems can be uh, much more effective and, uh, like I said, uh, advance the DoD's competitive advantage. But achieving these priorities is made more difficult uh, by a, a whole host of challenges. Uh, if you have been involved in software and system development for a while, you're likely aware and maybe even have done some manual practices like uh, agile and in-person code reviews that work really well at the small scale but have trouble uh, finding uh, corollaries at, at larger software and system development processes. Um, selecting software development and analysis methods is made harder without a clear understanding of the benefits and outcomes uh, of those analysis methods and, and methodologies. The data that gets collected on software development processes rarely accurately reflects the way the product actually uh, functions and the actual quality level. Uh, critical qualities like safety and security and uh, sustainability are only come up late in system and software development. Uh, even though really you can't bolt that stuff on, it has to be uh, integral to the system and developed sort of uh, throughout the product's life cycle. And finally, program managers don't really have insight into the actual state of the software, either from a security or a sustainability perspective. But these really are the challenges uh, that we're addressing here at the SEI. And central to the way that we think that these challenges should be addressed is by increasing automation. So there are a whole bunch of places that you can increase the automation in software development. Um, a lot of the stuff that my group works with is applying model-based techniques uh, for safe and secure system development while also uh, making sure that you're on track uh, as system development proceeds. Uh, from EPEC, you're going to hear a lot about implementing tool-supported system analyses uh, so that you can get better data and make uh, decisions as problems come up. Uh, you're also going to hear about software analytics, uh, some of which are uh, really modern and use uh, exciting techniques like AI uh, to improve, again, decision making. And then one of the things that has been uh, mentioned in all of the, the lead up talks to this, uh, but that I also want to highlight is that really uh, at the SCI, as an FFRDC, we play a cool role in that we are not really purely academia, but we're also not purely uh, government or, or industry. We really are sort of the bridge between those, and so we get to rapidly pilot these interim results in a way that uh, people at other research institutes might have a harder time doing. So uh, now I'm going to get a little bit more concrete and discuss uh, this ongoing project uh, that I'm leading with Peter Feiler, another research staff member here at the SEI, called Integrating Safety and Security Engineering for Mission Critical Systems. So the problem that we're looking at with this is that modern safety critical systems, so your medical devices, your airplanes, things that if they fail are really going to hurt somebody, um, are often created uh, by networking together different components. So of course, you know that uh, systems are rarely built sort of whole cloth, that components, whether they're off the shelf or custom built, are networked together. But uh, modern systems have to have those networks exposed <coughs> to the real world. Uh, this is for a number of reasons, but primarily it's increased functionality. The amount of computer you can fit on something that has to fly is, of course, a lot smaller than the amount of computer you can put on the ground. So if you can make your airplane speak to the ground, 
uh, then you can leverage those computational resources. But of course, this also exposes a number of new security risks, and so these safety critical systems are now also security critical. And I want to be really clear that in this talk, security can be really broadly understood as the ability to operate without interference from malicious actors, and safety is similar but deals with random or unintentional problems uh, rather than those caused by adversaries. And it's that safety critical work that people who have built airplanes and medical devices and other types of critical systems are experienced with working, uh, are experienced with working with, uh, less so than the security stuff. So what we want to do is see if security analysis and design techniques that have existed for a while but haven't traditionally been used by these safety critical system developers can be integrated with traditional safety focused uh, counterparts to these systems. So uh, the group that I work in uses AADL, uh, which is an architecture design language that has a, a long and successful history, about 15 years, in a whole range of uh, applications. If this is your first research review, it may be the first time you're hearing of it. This is the graphical language uh, that AADL looks like. It's not important to understand that diagram, but just know that it's sort of like a box and line diagram that system designers are used to drawing, except it has what we computer scientists call uh, formal semantics, that all of those uh, lines and boxes have very specific meanings. So uh, a good example of the way AADL works comes uh, from a story that the SEI and the CMU worked on a while ago uh, with a simulator for the F-16. So the way AADL is typically used is that you model the components of your system and you annotate them with information that is relevant to what you care about. Then you run system level analyses that collect all the information from all the components and in various ways uh, combine it into system level uh, values and reports. So with this F-16 simulator, pilots were complaining that there was some blurriness on a heads-up display. And what the team here at the SEI did uh, was model elements of that uh, display in the computer that ran it uh, to a high degree of fidelity. And what we found was that there was a connection that had a little bit of jitter. And the way that jitter lined up with what are called major frames, which are sort of the scheduling blocks uh, of the computer that ran the simulator, was such that uh, messages would arrive either right at the end of one major frame or the beginning of the next. And due to this interaction and the way these major frames uh, led to icons being rendered on the heads-up display, if the message arrived in one time, it would be here, and just slightly later, due to this natural jitter, it would be rendered over here. And so due to the jitter, the heads-up display icons were moving back and forth too rapidly uh, to be clearly seen. And so with this uh, timing analysis, we were able to solve this problem using this model-based engineering effort. So there are a number of analyses that can be run on AADL models once you have it built. It's not just timing information. The standard set of quality attributes like cost, power consumption, and weight, uh, but also more complicated attributes like safety. So uh, a couple of years ago, we wanted to look at how safety can be integrated throughout the life cycle instead of, like I mentioned earlier, bolted on at the end. And the solution to that was uh, a process and a toolkit called ELISA, which lets us address uh, system safety at the architecture level. And uh, one of the key ways that it does that is by uh, integrating requirements engineering and assurance throughout the system development life cycle. So instead of having uh, your system requirements in maybe a Word document, they can be in a machine readable language that can be linked to specific parts of the architecture that are responsible for meeting those requirements. And so then at any point, you can run a big check and it will analyze whether uh, all your requirements in your system are being met. And if you expect them to be met and they're not, you know where to look. And if they're not met just because you haven't implemented functionality, then you know where to go next. So in addition to safety, uh, a previous project you may have heard me talk about if you were here last year is how security functions at the architectural level. So of course, security means different things to different people, even within different parts of the DOD. Uh, on this project, we're talking a lot about confidentiality. <clears throat> so here we're building on some really cool theory that comes out of computer, the computer science uh, world called MILS, or the MILS approach, which really focuses on separating uh, a security policy from the enforcement of that policy. So we have a couple of domains here. You can think of them as classified and unclassified or even just red and green. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that these domains, they don't cross, that we don't have secret information sent to people who shouldn't be seeing it. And so we can analyze uh, the software elements in a AADL model and say, OK, we know uh, from our flow analysis that these domains don't cross. But because AADL also includes uh, hardware modeling, we can verify that not only is our software uh, security policy uh, good to go, but that when we bind things to uh, processors, memory banks, other hardware elements, that either those uh, hardware elements are not shared, in which case we expect them to function uh, up to speed, 
but, uh, or they are shared. And if they are shared, then we know that we have to look very carefully at how that partitioning is being enforced. Because if you have secret and non-secret information uh, computed on a shared processor, you need to look really closely and make sure that no information is going to leak between those. And then as part of this, pro uh, this project, you can actually generate and deploy your security policy uh, enforcing architecture to uh, certain formally verified uh, systems. <clears throat> so with this strong research base, we began to look into the combination of safety and security this year. Unfortunately, the problem isn't as easy as simply combining the two processes into one. Often security and safety requirements conflict, and so they have to be integrated more carefully. And any time you hear an academic say, ah, oh, we need to be sort of careful about this, they're going to want to turn back to the literature, back to the theory. And the theory that we have worked on here at the SEI and that has been established uh, sort of across the safety and security research worlds is that maybe an effects a uh, focused approach is the way to go. So in an effects focus, if, uh, if I'm a component and I'm getting input from other components, it doesn't really matter to me why uh, the input might have a bad value, right? That other component could be hacked, it could have just been built wrong, or there even could be just some sort of network error between, between me and that other component. But the upshot is, what am I going to do about it? What if we focus on, on fixing the effects of these errors rather than trying to root out every possible cause, many of which may not even be foreseeable when you're building a system? So armed with this effects focus, we're looking at uh, sort of established techniques like Biba and Bella Podula that may or may not be appropriate. We're looking at a collection of building blocks that a large European research organization that looked at safety and security overlap identified and said, OK, what's the impact of encryption? on safety and security? What's the impact uh, of partitioning or checksums? And then ultimately, because we have this strong uh, ELISA research base, how can we verify these requirements? So all of this is going to combine into um, design guidance and some tool support. And we're going to evaluate that in a future year of the project uh, with this user study. And we have a number of qualities that we're going to look at and compare our work to uh, existing work. If you've worked with AADL before, you know that really we are excited about tools uh, and, and the way that tools can support uh, best practices in software development. So uh, that is sort of the last thing that we're looking at here, is what sort of tooling uh, it works best with this effects-focused approach. And the answer to that is that we think that fault injection uh, pairs really naturally, and we're excited to, to work with a simulation environment that our collaborators at Kansas State University are building. So uh, they have this simulation environment. You can think of this rather abstract diagram as an, uh, a system of intercommunicating components. And maybe we care about this, uh, this blue component down here. Um, but to test some specific error behavior, we have to have a, a really complex set of error behaviors in the components that generate its input. So right now, you would have to mock all of this up. And you would have to build these, system, or these components to fail in very particular ways. And this is expensive, both in terms of time uh, and money. Uh, and testing budgets, of course, are never big enough. So with fault injection, we can actually just ignore these components and inject these faults indirectly. AADL today can describe the behavior of a component in the presence of errors, but we have no way of testing that. With this project and with fault injection, we'll be able to verify those specifications. So it's not so much now that uh, as it is now where developers can say, oh, this is what's going to happen if you send me a bad value, or this is what's going to happen if you send my component a message that doesn't arrive on time. With this, we'll actually be able to verify that. And uh, we think that's really exciting. So now I'm going to hand it off uh, to Epek Sky, who's going to talk about software analytics for technical debt. So if you've attended a number of the previous uh, research reviews, you've already heard me talk a little bit about technical debt. I'm actually very excited this year because this year we're going to be reporting some actual results from our work. Our project in the particular analysis aspects is coming to a close and moving to some of the newer areas. So that's going to be one of the differences that you're going to hear. But before I get started, I want to step back. And for uh, those of you who have, may not have heard the term or who may not know where we're coming from, I want to set the stage. So the problem we've seen, and Roman has already explained it, a lot of the software that our uh, key stakeholders and sponsors at the DOD and the government deal with legacy software. And this software has been around for a number of years. And a lot of the software that's actually being envisioned today is envisioned to be around until 2080. So it's really ridiculous amounts of times that people will not even be there. So you really need to look into these systems and approach these systems as living beings. 
Yes, you do everything right to be able to structure them correctly, designing security, safety, reliability, sustainability, yet you also acknowledge that they're going to get sick throughout their lifetime. DOD, especially our government stakeholders, are uh, struggling because they don't know what uh, techniques to put the pair to be able to prioritize what needs to be actually fixed because you cannot fix everything to be able to put techniques in terms of differentiating between these trade-offs, which often tend to be design trade-offs that actually are intentional, it's okay to leave, uh, or unintentional, which are actually going to create a significant amount of problems down the line. How do you prioritize which one to pay, and how do you actually quantify the effect of it? So this has been our focus for the last couple of years. And uh, the solution we had brought to is, is there's not actually one software artifact that goes into that problem. You need to be able to understand the code base. You need to be able to understand the design trade-offs. But you also need to be able to understand the ecosystem that the software developers and different kinds of uh, organizations or sub uh, teams are interacting with, the testers, quality assurance uh, teams. And now we've actually had the continuous integration and DevOps pipeline individuals added to it. So it's a combination of multiple artifacts facts for understanding how they introduce evidence to understanding what you need to pay down and what you can keep in the code base. So that's been our approach. And if we look into, again, the different gears that we've been playing around, since there it affects multiple aspects of it, software development is not necessarily a stage-wise activity. It's like gears help each other move forward. We're focusing on particular aspects of it. So our approach had been a three-pronged, looking into different artifacts and combining them, and I'll show you examples of these. So we uh, focused on building a classifier that can help detect technical debt discussions from the conversations that the developers might be having or from their issue trackers and tickets that they have in the system. And uh, this actually has a benefit in terms of being able to understand where uh, you may need to focus your effort or incentivize the developers how they could actually move forward from some of their uh, systems. Static code analyzers, and if you've been paying attention to this space, have actually taken advantage of the technical that scare as well as the opportunity as repurposing themselves as, okay, if you run static code analyzers, you're going to know your technical debt and reduce your technical debt. Our earlier research results have actually demonstrated this has potential drawbacks as introducing a false scare, as well as missing some of the significant aspects of it. So our approach has been on trying to understand, can we still take advantage of the capabilities of these tools, but augment it with a level of analysis that both reduces the number of issues that you need to look into it based on their priorities, as well as help you focus on the critical design aspects. And how do you correlate it with the rest of the uh, uh, development space, such as the commit history and how developers are actually changing the code base so you have further evidence base? So that's been our focus on in terms of the several aspects. And we've been very fortunate to work with not only researchers, but also some of our uh, stakeholders as partners, such as the Air Force Life Cycle uh, Management Center and the Food and Drug Administration. So if I step back and really look into how we've actually advanced the state of the art, I want to start with the bottom line. So this is a pipeline of a tool chain that actually has input from the multiple different kinds of analyzers. And we've used, obviously, from an a opportunistic perspective, some of our select uh, open source uh, anal uh, analyzers and developed some of the scripting for the commit history and static code analysis perspective. But you can actually augment it in time with other analyzers. So, there is a pipeline where analyzers actually get input from source code, commit history, or any issue tracker or other uh, lateral language uh, data that you made for the system. It goes through different clustering and ranking uh, procedures that we've developed and then presents to the developers or uh, project managers in terms of, OK, what is the impact that you're seeing? And then you can move forward in terms of deciding how you can actually proceed. If I look into some of the uh, outcomes of the techniques, our classifier actually is able to detect the amount of technical debt discussion that goes within a particular system. May, the example I have here is coming from an open source system, Chromium Issue Tracker. It's opportunistic because it has really well-structured data. And also, we can talk about it openly. And a significant amount of that actually software system is uh, related to technical debt conversation. So it's not just an industry uh, government problem. It's also an industry problem. So we live in that, again, because uh, going back to the analogy I made earlier, software systems are living systems. And I talked about the 
overall uh, navigation problem that the developers face when they run analyzers, which are really powerful, and they're actually getting more powerful by taking advantage of some of the AI and classification techniques. But yet, if I'm presented with thousands and thousands and thousands of issues, I don't know where to start. So our analysis techniques have been able to reduce that analysis space significantly and actually present the higher priority issues that the developers should start with at least. And of course, we thinking that these are problems is one way of looking at it. Are the teams that we're working with agreeing with us that those are areas that they struggle with? More importantly, are we finding things they may have missed? And we have actually a number of examples to demonstrate to both of those. So now I'm going to give us a little overview of a little bit deeper down technical insights into these projects so both of you can actually understand where we're coming from into these tasks as well as maybe ask further questions or after you leave, maybe download some of these scripts and play around with them or collaborate with us in terms of what we might actually go do together going forward. So let me start with the detecting the discussions of technical debt with machine learning techniques. This was actually a no-brainer step for us. What ha the, how it started is when, as we were working with organizations and we were trying to understand, well, okay, what constitutes technical debt? Is it really repurposing of maintainability and sustainability? Or are we really facing some phenomenon in these software systems that we need to treat differently? So we had uh, data from our experience both throughout the years working with uh, quite a number of organizations in uh, evolving their software, doing risk analysis on their architecture, and so on. But we also had started recognizing that developers actually know about these. So we developed a machine learning uh, algorithm focusing on modeling with uh, a technique which is called boosting algorithms. And what they do is they actually take the weighted average of many classification trees so that they can iteratively improve the classifier. The challenge here is you don't necessarily have the existing data. So one of our significant uh, outcomes of this work is we've actually been able to produce data that other researchers can use. And there's actually now some knowledge in terms of what constitutes technical debt, what not. What is some of the vocabulary that might be going into that pipeline to be able to train a classifier and uh, take advantage of it. We have developed an active uh, learning pipeline about uh, 2,000 uh, issues, to be more exact, 1,934 issues, which I personally all read, as well as my uh, colleagues in our teams. And what this actually does, even if you do nothing, is looking at these examples, you might start thinking, okay, do I see similarities with my development ecosystem? Should I empower my developers and my decision makers, my technical teams, behaving differently or categorizing these issues differently so that they don't accumulate and become huge refactoring costs down the line. And of course, what excites us, our team, is how do you actually use these algorithms? What goes into the feature engineering? What are some of the key concepts that you could actually fine tune these algorithms with? And that's one of our uh, outcomes as well. If uh, I very quickly show what might be going on here, our classifier actually performs uh, quite reasonably well. And uh, we, if we compi compare with the baseline that we did, which is, I'll just use the key phrase query, and the key phrase query might be, okay, you might say, Ipek, that's all fine, but I can actually go for, uh, in my uh, data set and say, well, anybody who's talking about refactoring is actually really talking about these design trade-offs, which does not seem to be the case. So our classifier actually performs better to be able to really zoom into the things that might matter more. Moving along, I talked about the static code analyzers, and this actually has been a space for a long time. If you're in security analysis, you uh, know about this, uh, these uh, sets of tools. If you're in software maintainability, you know these uh, sets of tools. They do help you identify some of the coding issues that might be introduced based on some of the quality checks. What actually, however, they might miss is, well, you might be having these issues in areas of your system that do not change, or in areas of your system that change a lot, but you keep introducing new mistakes. So by combining other data sets, such as how often a particular set of classes change, how they change together, versus whether there's a one sing, uh, significant, one or two significant number of areas that change regardless what you change across the system, you're able to again zoom in and more uh, to the specific aspects of the data collection uh, perspective. 
So we've augmented this static code analysis uh, with an approach we call design rules. What we uh, recognize as we work with these uh, systems is, yes, they are more uh, syntactic checks, but if you start combining them in uh, categories of design paradigms, let's say exception handling, logging, uh, security analysis, as well as maintainability and modifiability and so on, you're actually able to zoom in on some of the specific design issues that the teams may be missing because they're just focused on the syntactic aspects. And once you correlate it with the commit history data, then you actually start getting more evidence and be able to say, okay, why a particular area should need to be changed prior to another one based on all that data specific uh, evidence that you collect. And again, uh, this pipeline is available as well as some of the open source data we have. I'm going to show you some snippets from a uh, uh, cleansed data from some of our collaborators with their permission. So we've applied it to uh, actual projects, nine projects across the board, and we've uh, followed them, three of them, throughout uh, their iteration over a year and a half. And as a result, the organization actually started uh, adapting some of these practices. But one thing, one uh, aha moment for us, which shouldn't have been maybe in retrospect, when we talk about maintainability, sustainability costs, yes, they are important. Yes, they actually add to the overall cost of ownership. Uh, bottom line, on the other hand, when your software crashes today, that's not the priority. When you have to add a new feature, that's not the priority. If it's actually not changing as often or you haven't heard any uh, heartache from any of your users, that's not the priority. On the other hand, when you demonstrate that actually this, these areas are coupled with some of those more observable problems, then both the team starts uh, putting them more high priority, but it's also easier to communicate with the project stakeholders in terms of how to take advantage of them. Again, some examples that are here. For example, logging is one that actually has been missed uh, quite often, as well as exception handling, and our data sets uh, provide that information. And here's another example of the reduction of the space that you're looking at. This is from an open source uh, example, Hadoop. So at the end, if you look into the overall files, from the 12,000 files that actually have demonstrated any of those issues existing, we're actually able to reduce it to a couple dozen that demonstrate areas that actually have the significant amount of the design rules. And this is not only based on magnitude, it's actually a combination of the specific aspects of design violations such as exception handling, as well as security, and some of, oftentimes security violations are a handful, but they get lost, and combining with uh, other development information. And here I'm just giving an example, but if you go uh, to some of the references I will give at the end, there's more information there. So at the end, uh, we've been at this space looking more in terms of detecting, identifying technical that in the uh, code bases, we've actually come up with a toolbox, if you will. So there's actually your part and our part in terms of the toolbox. How does the SCI accelerate the progress? Uh, one of our projects have been, and this was a complimentary actually customer project, is to help uh, government uh, governments to see whether these tools require some policy and what could be, could be some of the policy guidelines around using these analysis tools for design analysis. What might be some of the organizational practices that are easy to introduce today while the tools uh, are catch up or while your infrastructure actually is able to incorporate these tools. Today, uh, a number of industry organizations are actually incorporating these static analyzers I've exemplified in their DevOps tool chains. So the tool infrastructures are getting there to be able to incorporate these capabilities sooner than later. And of course, it's not just picking those tools up, we're extending and developing them further on down the line as well. The bottom line, all of these is data and evidence, and I think this is a common thread with the opportunities that AI, machine learning, and all of that presents, but they have been there for a while, so it's really based on the data. And one of the things that we're very proud of is building a community of practice around it. Today, we have actually a very strong uh, research community as well as an industrial collaborations that uh, meet through conferences as well as other things. And what can you go back to your teams and uh, say as what something maybe you've learned from these 15 minutes uh, that I've uh, covered this work, how do you become aware of your debt? 
How do you assess it using uh, some of these techniques? How do you build your technical debt registry, things that you've known, using the correct vocabulary so some of, if some of those team members leave, other ones who pick up can actually still be able to uh, go and uh, fix them down the line and decide what to fix and take action. With that, I'm going to switch gears and give you a little bit of a teaser in terms of what's happening next uh, based on what the things that we've learned here. So looking ahead, we're actually continuing to focus on the automation, but it's really about fixing the systems. Detecting is important. You want to know what you're facing up against, but that's really only part of the story. How do you continue to fix these problems, and how does that become a continuous and evolvable life cycle? So I'm going to give a very quick overview of the two projects that are going to be starting actually as we speak that uh, puts the learnings that we had from these projects into the next stage. The first one is evolving the DoD software where we're looking into how you actually refactor large systems. Legacy is a problem. We have to live with that legacy, but that also has significant value within it. There's functionality, there's capability. You may want to preserve, but maybe lift to more modern platforms. And how do you actually do that with uh, automated design assistance is the goal, uh, problem that we're addressing there. How do you harvest these components, replace them with proprietary uh, at once, and how do you reduce the coupling between the software as well as the hardware? So our approach there is to look into an automated uh, component refactoring uh, assistant and uh, see how we can recommend architecture refactorings. Our approach very quickly is again focus on the architecture requirements and the code aspects of it. How do you formalize these refactorings and how do you develop algorithms to be able to create the uh, recommendations? The next project is the using machine learning for software analysis and this is an area, yes, we have excitement around uh, AI and capabilities of machine learning. Can we put them to use for software engineering efficiency? And this is a a small pilot project where we're going to see if we can actually detect some of these design problems, particularly focusing on uh, model view controller because that's in our experience is very common across the board and uh, develop some of the detection and then put them into the continuous integration pipelines. So that's the long-term vision. Rather than waiting longer terms, can we actually bring the detection as well as fixing earlier to the development life cycle and enable uh, change earlier? Everything I've talked about is available online, but as well as SAMS, there are tool bases. We have papers as well as some of these tools are available. Please go look at them, and uh, if you want to play around with them, let us know. We have strong communities around them. Again, the Savvy community as well as the Tech Debt community. And we also transition to not only to our government partners, but to this uh, broader software engineering community. Uh, Roman talked about the AEDL. Book by, and there's an upcoming book early in 2019 by Edison Wesley on what we've learned on managing technical debt. It's meant to be a practitioner book, which we're very excited about. And lastly, please engage with us. Yes, Sam and I represented a number of our projects, but quite a number of our team members are among uh, all of us here and uh, talk to us, ask us any questions. With that, I would like to invite Sam back and uh, have a little bit of interaction. We've been talking to you all morning, and if you have any questions for me and Sam, we'd be happy to address them. Okay. Yes, no, I can, it's, can see, but not really see. <laughs> The slides, I'm pretty sure, are available online. Yes, the slides will be available, so you'll have access to the references as well as the others. And the video as well. Sorry, I have to see. <laughs> to, so the question is, how far are you going back into the model-based ar architecture? Yeah, 
so uh, the techniques that we've developed so far work on the code, but code is a model. And the way you structure the code in terms of the classes, the files, and what that could be represented by files. We haven't really looked at models in terms of the diagrams, but there's opportunities to look into it. But you're right, the goal is to go as far back into the life cycle, but our work has been focused on the code analysis, what we have done. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the challenges with model-based engineering, as I'm sure you know, is getting things to sort of work across the life cycle. Like a lot of times, once you have your model and you use it to generate code, you have tools then that operate on that code. So definitely, this is something that we're going to be looking at going forward. But um, within AADL, I don't think that there are, are tools that will find tech debt within your models, for example. But I definitely makes sense. There makes sense, and there's also this aspect of it, which actually came up in some of the projects we worked specifically with actual uh, projects. Generated code, do you actually scan the generated code, which was coming from the models, right. and then give feedback to the uh, models? And one of our findings is one of the projects was the generated code had a lot of issues. And the organization, when we brought this back to them, we said, well, this is on the generated code. Do you even care? And their response was, are you kidding me? We were having so many problems, no wonder why. So there's those kinds of bridges that are potentially uh, opportunities to create between model-based uh, tools as well as the code-based analysis aspects. So I really like this talk as well. Um, I had a question about tying some things together. So, so I think you've used um, machine learning to be able to determine the ways that, that uh, a specific organization represents um, their own technical debt. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of whether or not that's something that transfers from one organization to another? So that's yeah. question A. Mm -hmm. And then question B, um, the, the, the SCI puts out a number of um, coding standards. And if we were to augment those coding standards in ways to clearly identify technical debt, do you think that would be a helpful thing? Yes, so the first question is an excellent question. One of our goals has been actually to be able to see that. So looking into the features we have, our uh, expert opinion is, yes, they're transferable, but we haven't been able to run it at the scale we've been able to run it at the Chromium because the chicken and egg in this problem is the data set, yet we have set that pipeline and there's opportunities and we're looking into that. So to give an example of some of the key concepts that are actually emerging is, which we thought actually refactoring and redesign would be, but that uh, was not the case, but some of these like, this is a hack, is, which could transfer, or this is a hack coupled with lengthy discussion of a specific design concept there, or a particular s component that keeps reappearing are some of the concepts that actually could transfer, and we have others uh, as well. For the other uh, question in terms of augmentation, yes, there are opportunities to augment, at least with some of these scripts, but we haven't really looked into like how CERT has done secure coding practices, but that's definitely an opportunity, and all of the data we have could serve as uh, the next step. Others? Uh, so once you have a, a good measure of technical debt, uh, that then creates a, a need for something called a modernization project. And modernization projects have a remarkably uh, 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 high failure rate uh, in the federal government yes. as well as in the, in the commercial organizations. Uh, how do you address that issue? So I, I could have seeded that question, so thank you for that <laughs> question. We do not approach technical debt as a gate to modernization necessarily, because it's like that's what we wait. Yes, today, unfortunately, the software engineering industry is at the space where we have so much of it, we don't know where to start, there's so much unintentional technical debt, but in time, we see it as a continuous activity that you have to do, because these systems live for a while, and in term, it's not necessarily the gate for modernization. Yes, I agree. It could be a one input, but there's so much other uh, things, constraints that go into modernization. That's why we're actually f uh, shifting focus. Let's help fix these systems. And that, again, needs to be iterative and continuous. So that's the best answer. 
And going once, going twice. Last question. Hi, Peg. This is Hassan. Thanks for the great talk, and same as Sam. Quick question. So what do you think about getting early feedback on technical debt throughout the life cycle? The question like, is, how do we get early feedback for on technical debt? Let's say you have a feature in the pipeline, and how you how you think like getting early feedback is we are in the right track or are we need the right work and based on the features. So what do you think about getting early feedback to the everybody else in the life cycle? So I think there are two aspects of it. One is if you made the right decision, that has all sorts of different aspects. But if you've actually created these pipelines, it could at least give you feedback from the perspective of are you introducing unintentional technical debt? Are you making the right design decision requires other kind of practices. So there's a qualitative practices as well as a, as well as a quantitative practice aspect of it. So the tool chains could help in terms of being on the right track as well and the qualitative practices could help in terms of making the right design choices. I think with that, going once, going twice,